When the WCB program began, an historic compromise was reached whereby workers gave up their right to sue employers in the event of a workplace injury in exchange for wage replacement, medical coverage and rehabilitation benefits. All workers in a mandatory coverage industry are automatically covered. Voluntary coverage is also available for some industries and occupations, such as farming, <laughs> clergy, and marketing representatives whose companies do not have a Saskatchewan base. It's also available for sole proprietors, partners, and directors not carried on the payroll. Employers in a mandatory industry are required to register for an account within 30 days of workers starting. Now, one of the principles of WCB is exclusive jurisdiction. This means that the rules of the province where the work is performed will supersede the rules of an out-of-province employer's home base. Firms that meet our frequency or duration criteria of our out-of-province employer coverage policy and who operate in a mandatory industry are subject to the same rules as any Saskatchewan-based employer for registration and reporting. This includes any out-of-province contractors you may engage for services. In a nutshell, an employer is the one who pays for the work provided by a worker. Whether that worker is hired on a full-time, part-time, casual, contract or payroll basis. And who is the worker? It's anyone who will receive a T4, including directors of corporation, as well as any contractors or subcontractors, apprentices or students in a work-based learning assignment. Okay, so you're registered. Now what? Let's talk about the employer basics. As an employer, you must report your annual payroll and contractor wages by February 28th, obtain clearances and letters of good standing, pay your annual premiums on time, report injuries to WCB within five days of being notified of the injury, and provide a safe workplace. Eilish is going to explain how your premiums are calculated and how claims will affect your rates. So let's have a look at your filing requirements clearances and contractors. Every employer who has an existing employer account with our office is required to complete and submit their employer's payroll statement, also called the EPS. Many of you in this room may have been the ones who completed this annual report, which is due on February 28th. The EPS is the annual reconciling between your estimated wages and your actual wages paid in the previous calendar year as well as your estimate for the current year. If you obtain clearances for your payments on your contractors, most of that work for reporting contractors will already be done. When you receive your EPS, all that you'll need to do is verify the amounts. However, a description will be required for any work, uh, I'm sorry, for work that was um, obtained and you obtained the deemed clearances. Any contractors that you did not obtain clearance for or whose amounts vary from the EPS amount should be reported on the contractors to be reported section. <coughs> Payroll estimates need to be as accurate as possible as well to avoid any penalties. Revisions to payroll estimates can be made any time during the year as many times as necessary as long as you do it prior to December 31st to avoid the underestimate penalty. Revisions can be submitted online by email, fax, mail, or by phone. If you do not return the EPS, you will be subject to an arbitrary assessment, and that will include cancellation of any optional personal coverage on the file, and will exclude you from any experience rate discounts. So filing your EPS online can be done using your online services account. However, you do not need an online services account in order to do this. You can su still submit online using something called FastFile. No account is required, just your firm number and your annual access code. FastFile is a great option if you have a third party, for example, your accountant, submit your payroll report. It gives them access to submit on your behalf, but does not give them access into your online services account. When you click on the employer section of our website or on the banner display, you will have the option to choose to submit either by FastFile or online account. 
Either way, it's the same program, just different ways to access it. Okay, so you ask me, why report online? Because it's quick and easy, there's no paper required, you can preview before you submit, you receive an instant confirmation that we have received your EPS and that will come to you by email. You can file from anywhere. It's great for snowbirds or for those who work away from their home base. And it provides you with improved accuracy. And did you know that if you fail to press the submit button to file your EPS, you will receive notification from us by email within 10 days. <clears throat> Once the EPS is processed, revisions can also be made online. It's important to be as accurate as possible though, with your estimate as these provisional wages will be used in the rate setting calculation process. The underestimate penalty is assessed when the difference between the estimated wages and the actual wages is more than 50%. This penalty is 6% of your premiums due. So for example, Joe estimates that he'll pay wages of $50,000 to his one worker, an apprentice. However, he decides to hire a second worker in August because business is going better than anticipated. And he decides he'll pay this worker $30,000. As this is a 60% increase in the expected wages, he will need to make sure he files a revision with us before the end of December to avoid any penalty. Revising your payroll estimate online is quick and easy as well. You click on to payroll and then on to revise your payroll estimate to make changes anytime and as many times as you need online. And don't forget, make sure that you submit your changes before December 31st to avoid the underestimate penalty. Things to remember about your EPS. File by February 28 to avoid the late filing penalty. Be as accurate as possible with your estimate and if necessary make revisions before the end of December to avoid any penalty. Don't forget to file your EPS so that you won't be subject to an arbitrary assessment nor will you miss out on any experience rate discounts. Don't forget to make your payment on time. Making your payment on time ensures that there are no delays with clearances on work you may have performed for principals. Payments are generally due within 30 days of the billing date on the statement of account. However, your first payment for the current year might be due on the 1st of April if your assessment is completed by our office by March 2nd. If your premiums for the current year are greater than $125, the second installment will be due the 1st of September. Paying your premiums online can be done with your Visa, MasterCard, American Express, your Visa debit, as well as now your MasterCard debit. Online payment will post to your account within the next business day, and online payments can be made without a WCB online account. So contractors. Did you know that contract situations exist in all industries? Some companies hire employees only, some companies hire employees and contractors, and some only hire contractors or subcontractors. Employers often think that contractors are only in the construction industry, or they also believe they do not need to report anyone who has their own business. So in the restaurant industry, for example, contractors can include but are not limited to individuals or businesses who may clean your range hood or fix your refrigeration system. For business offices, Contractors could be individuals or businesses who provide garbage and recycling services, lawn maintenance and snow removal, or possibly property maintenance. In clinics and healthcare facilities, contractors can be therapists or other healthcare professionals, janitors, anyone that you've hired to do any electrical work or plumbing work, etc. The key here is that these examples are true in all industries. Now, if a contractor only provides materials but no installation at all, they're considered to be a supply-only contract and that does not need to be reported to WCB. There's no labour component included. An example would be groceries that are delivered to a restaurant. So as I've mentioned, you're required to report any contractors on your annual EPS. But what exactly do we mean by principal and a contractor? 
The contractor in the relationship is the one who will be paying the contractor. The contractor is the one who is paid by the principal to provide the service. Contractor is basically anyone that you do not carry on your payroll. A non-registered contractor is, for the purposes of WCB, considered to be the principal's worker. A principal who hires a non-registered contractor will be responsible for paying premiums on the labor portion of that contract. It's important to know that a contract does not need to be a formal contract. It can be written or oral, express or implied. Anytime a firm hires a contractor, the contractor must be reported to WCB, regardless of whether the contractor has their own WCB account. Sections 131 and 132 of the Workers' Compensation Act 2013 require a principal to confirm whether or not the contractor has their own coverage, as well requires the principal to ensure that any amount the contractor is due to pay to the injury fund is paid. To help fulfill these requirements, we have the letter of good standing and the clearance letter. The purpose of both of these is to ensure that everyone carries their fair share of the assessment premiums. Both can be requested by either the principal or the contractor. Letters of good standing confirm the status of the contractor. So are they registered or not? Are they in good standing or not? They should be obtained before a contractor sets foot on your work site. It's important to know that some contractors are eligible for coverage, but it is only effective 12.01 a.m. the day following their application for coverage, which means if the coverage is requested after the work has started, the principal will be responsible to cover the contractor as their worker until the contractor's coverage is effective. <clears throat> a clearance letter will also tell you the status of the account. It will let you know whether or not you are approved to make that payment to the contractor. And a clearance letter will protect the principal from having to pay any overdue premiums the contractor owes. When you request a letter of good standing or a clearance, our system does several checks. The first thing it does is check, does the contractor have their own WCB account? If the answer is no, you will receive a deemed status. This means the contractor is considered to be your worker for the period of time they're working for you. You can go ahead and pay them, and you will be assessed for the labor portion of that contract at the time of assessment. Please note, if you receive a deemed status, premiums cannot be deducted from the, con from the contractor unless heavy equipment is provided with that contract. If the contractor has their own account, the system will next check, is the account in good standing? If the account is in good standing, you'll receive a cleared status, which means we have no issues with this contractor, you're approved to make the payment and you will not be assessed any premiums uh, at the end of the year. However, if that contractor is not in good standing, you will receive a hold status. So a hold letter will be issued to you requesting that you do not release payment until further notified by our office. This could take a few weeks in order to allow the contractor to bring their account back into good standing. A cleared status will be issued if the account is brought back into good standing. If the account is in arrears, though, and the contractor fails to bring their account up to date within three weeks of that hold letter date, you will receive what's called a demand, and that is a request from our office to pay us any amounts due. If there is any balance left in that contract amount, you can then release it to the contractor. You may also receive a pending status. Now, pending status does not necessarily mean there's anything wrong with that contractor's account. It simply means that the system is unable to complete the check for authorization without a manual review. Once the manual review is done, you will receive your updated status. This can take up to four business hours. So requesting clearances. You can do that using your online services account by calling, or sorry, by emailing our employer services inbox, by calling our toll-free number, by faxing in to our toll-free fax number, 
or using the Automatic Clearance Verification, or ACV. This provides automatic email notification of any contractor status changes. A reminder to you that the letter of good standing and the letter of clearance can be requested by either the principal or the contractor. This is the landing page you'll see when you sign into your online services account and select clearances. From this point, you can request letters of good standing, request a clearance, you can review your past history of what you have requested for clearances and letters of good standing, and you can sign into your automatic uh, clearance verification and manage your contractor lists. Who is who when requesting one of these letters is very important. For a letter of good standing, the principal is hiring other companies and needs the status check on their accounts. The contractor for a letter of good standing is the one contracted to do the work, and needs the status check on their account. A letter of good standing does not replace a clearance. For clearances, the principal is the one who needs to pay for other companies' services and needs clearances on their accounts. And for clearances, the contractor did the work and needs clearance on his account in order to get paid. It is important to properly select the principal and the contractor when requesting these documents as this may affect your assessment. And did you know, you can also view clearances previously requested for your contractors by clicking on clearance history. Okay, so question for you now. How many of you use or have heard of automatic clearance verification or ACV? Okay, a few people. So ACV is a way to manage your contractor lists through your online services account. The ACV function enables the user to create a list of frequently used contractors. From this ACV list, you can create lists for different projects or locations, but at the end of the year, the total for each contractor will be summed up and downloaded onto your EPS. An email will automatically be sent from WCB if the status changes on the contractor's account from deemed, or sorry, to deemed or hold. And the ACV allows the principal to check the status of the contractor's account simply by signing in. You can put the contract amount in at the beginning of the year, and you can continue to pay the contractor for the year as long as you are not notified to hold payment. Your requirement to use this program is to update the contract dollar amounts before the end of the year. Once you've created your lists, you can go in to manage your existing lists. Here you have an example of a primary list and a project list. You can go in and you can edit. You can edit here for the ACV content information. And here you can edit for the contractor details. At the same point, you can download a copy of the ACV results. And that copy would look like this. At this point, I'm going to turn over the presentation to my colleague Ailish, who will lead you through premium rates and rate setting, and how your online services account can help you manage your rates and claims. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ailish Whitmore, as Maggie said, and I work in the employer premiums department. Uh, we work with employers to uh, we discuss your rates, how claims have impacted your rates, or how they may impact your, your rate. Um, I guess before I start, I should give you a warning. I am Irish. So I may not, <laughs> even though English is my first language, I have been told that uh, I'm pretty, can be difficult to understand. So let me reassure you, we have a team of people at the back. We even have an Irish man, so I feel assured that some, at least one person in the room is going to understand me. But uh, we have a team of people uh, at the back who will answer any queries or questions that you have as well. So as I said, uh, just for the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to bring you through uh, the different rates that are on your account. Um, so just getting started. Uh, so firstly, uh, Maggie spoke about reporting an injury. So did you know that uh, you must report an injury within five days of being aware of it? Um, Maggie spoke about this earlier as one of your responsibilities as an employer to the WCB. Uh, this can be done by completing what is called an employer's initial report of injury, or often referred to as an E1. And this is what the form looks like. Um, don't forget when you are filling out this form to include the claimant's occupation, uh, your own workers' compensation board number, 
and whether or not that worker is a, on the payroll or is a, is a contractor. This is especially important if you manage multiple accounts and avoid, avoids uh, claims being incorrectly assigned. So we have throughout the presentation been highlighting uh, online accounts, and your online accounts and the benefits of having one. So completing uh, an E1 online um, is beneficial. You just go on to your employer account, uh, go to report a workplace injury, and there's five steps. Uh, so, and, and again, just fill it out and it'll submit online. So the next two slides I'm going to cover uh, is your industry rate and your firm rate. So we have two rates at the WCB just to, to make life a little bit interesting. Um, so your business is classified within one of 50 uh, industry classifications that we have at the board. So we each year calculate a rate for each individual industry classification and it is based on the collective liability of all employers within that industry code. So for example, if you operate within the trucking industry, you would be in T42, have a business office, your S12, so we have 50 of those. Um, and it is calculated based on a ratio of uh, claims cost to payroll. So all new employers with the Workers' Compensation Board start off by paying the industry rate. And I understand we have quite a few new employers here at this event um, over the last couple of days. So did you know this rate, uh, it has its own event annually. Uh, in October each year, we announce the preliminary, a word I never can say, uh, industry rate. Uh, so I don't know if many of you have ever attended this, but the, it happens uh, around the middle of October. Uh, in November, the board approves those rates and employers in early December are advised via their rate advice letter about the rate that they will pay for the coming year. For those of you that are lucky enough to have an online account, you will get this rate, rate advice letter the minute it's um, released from our system. Uh, otherwise, we have to mail 44,000 uh, rate advice letters in the mail, so it can take a few weeks to actually get to you. So the next uh, rate is your firm rate. This is the actual rate that you will pay. Um, we often, often you, you may uh, recognize it as, we also call it uh, the net premium rate. So th as I say, this is the actual rate you pay per $100 of payroll. So for example, if you report to the Workers' Compensation Board um, payroll of $10,000, uh, and your firm rate is $2, you will pay us a premium of $200. So it's for every $100 of payroll. Uh, this rate will either be equal to, less than, or more than the industry rate. And that's if you qualify for our experience rating program, which I'll talk about now. So the experience rate program provides an incentive to influence injury, prevention, and safe work behavior. Most employers qualify for the experience rating program when they have three years experience with the Workers' Compensation Board. And what we mean by experience is, for example, we look at it, if you've paid premiums in three years. So uh, for 2019, uh, if you paid premiums to us in 15, 16, and 17, then you would have qualified for either a discount surcharge. Um, so we also refer to that three year experience as the evaluation window. So did you know your annual rate is calculated in the prior year? So for the 2019 rate, we would have calculated that in 2018. We don't use the 2018 rate because we don't have a completed year. When we calculated it in that year, we don't have your completed premiums or your claims costs. And we use the data from your employer experience rate uh, summary, which I'll show you later on, uh, to calculate your rates. We use the premiums and the claims costs from that report. So as part of the experience rating program, we have two separate programs. We have the standard program and the advanced program. The standard program is for the smaller employer. So I think around 88% of our employers are in this pro program. And it's for those of you that have paid us less than 21,000 in that three year uh, evaluation window. So in 15, 16, 17, if you paid us less than 21,000, you would have qualified under this program. We look at the number of time loss claims that you have in order to calculate your rate. If you had no time loss claims with us, you would receive a 25% discount. If you have one or two, you, you pay that industry rate. 
three, four, or five, you uh, 25 percent, 50 percent, and 75 percent. The maximum discount in this program is 25 percent. The maximum surcharge in this program is 75 <laughs> percent. So. This is your rate advice letter. So uh, does everybody recall receiving that back in November? Yeah. So I'm just going to go through exactly what this rate advice letter tells you. So it does tell you um, what industry classification you're in. So as you can see, um, this uh, industry is classified under R11. We're probably not too clear. Uh, under road work, earthquake, uh, moving and paving. This employer is in the standard program. It's in the standard program. Uh, the industry rate for R11 is 160. So every employer would have, would, be, would have 160 as their industry rate. That was in the classification R11. This employer received a net premium rate of $1.20. So that is the rate that they will pay per $100 of payroll. The total base premiums is listed here. I'm going to try and get this steady here. <laughs> So that's seven, <laughs> seven and a half thousand, which is under the 21,000. <laughs> the total claims cost, uh, that's 18,000. It's highlighted here. Um, and the number of claims. So even if there's eight no time loss claims here, this employer will receive a discount. Even though that are, there's uh, 18,000 costs or claims costs and eight no time loss claims, that's a bit exaggerated, but they will still receive that 25% discount because there is no time loss claims registered. Uh, so the maximum discount will be 25% and there's also a detailed explanation as to why this employer would have received a discount. So the next program is the advanced program. So this is around, uh, so this is the larger employer that would have paid us more than 21,000 in that three year uh, window. This program is cost based. So we look at the, the cost of a claim. So we don't care how many, many uh, claims you have, it's all about the cost in this, pro in this program. It has a maximum discount of 30% and a maximum surcharge of 200%. Uh, this program is where employers are compared to others within the industry. So if your firm's weighted loss ratio is less than the industry's, you will receive a discount. And if it is more than that, you will receive a surcharge. Uh, and just to note as well, uh, I don't know if many of you in the room is in the advanced program, but we have a very useful template, which we would be delighted to show you afterwards as to how to, your rate is calculated. Um, we are happy to share that with you as well. Um, so it can be useful if you're trying to uh, calculate your rate and, and determine how claims impact your, the cost of a claim might impact your rate. So this is the rate advice letter. So as you can see, uh, this business is classified uh, under T42, which is trucking. They're in the advanced program. Surcharge position, the industry rate is $3.02. So that's for everybody that's in the trucking industry, that rate. The net premium rate is $7.58. So this employer will pay $7.58 per $100 of payroll. The total base premiums are $150,000, hence why they qualify for the advanced program. The total capped cost is 320000 Now, just to note that you may not be able to see it, but the total cap cost, the total cost of the claim is 340000 but we actually use the total capped cost to calculate your rate. Each year, uh, we have a maximum assessable earning per employer. So in 2019, that maximum assessable earning is 88314 So that's per employee. That's, what you, that's all you report to us on your payroll statement. So similarly to that, if a claims cost is more than that, we will cap it and only use the capped amount to calculate your rate. So the firm's weighted loss ratio here is 170% and the industry is 52%. So hence why they get a surcharge of 151%. Uh, there's also a reason at the bottom as to why. So I don't know if many of you manage your claims online. Uh, it is the only way to access your claims reports and be able to see frequently um, the cost of claims. Uh, so I'm just going to take you through briefly the different claims reports that are available online. We have your, there is a monthly report. It's called your injury cost statement. Um, 
I will go into, go into these in a little bit more detail as well. You have your experience summary report, your annual cost per claim, and the total cost per claim. So just did you know that we do update the monthly costs every month, obviously. Um, they're usually available, the data is updated usually the first week of the following month. Uh, prior year costs are final, so costs in 18 are final, so we only adjust the 2019 rates. Um, all these reports are now available in Excel, which is pretty exciting for those employers that use those reports to, uh, for their own internal reporting. And also, if you hire a third party, this is a really useful tool uh, to be able to assign them agent access to just manage reports. So they will be able to just uh, look at your costs per month and be able to report to you and manage those claims for you more, um, more easily. So talking about adding an agent, that's pretty simple. If you are the online administrator on, for your online account, you can simply add, the, add them as an agent um, and then just select which aspects of your account you would like them to manage. So you can select reports and that's all they'll be able to see. Or you can get somebody to, if you just want them to manage your reporting of your payroll, you can select employer payroll statement. If you just want them to manage your clearances, they can do that for you. The online administrator is the only person who has full access to that online account because of the sensitive information that is available online. So this is what your uh, injury cost statement looks like. And again, it's a monthly report, um, and it outlines the cost type and date to which the cost applies. Um, if you have no costs, there will be no report generated for that month. Um, this is quite a useful report. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if many of you have received adjustments to claims such as like cost relief. This is a very uh, easy way to see those credit and debit adjustments relating to the claim. So I do encourage you, if you are managing your claims closely, to have a look at that report. So the next one is your employer experience summary. And this is the report I referred to earlier. Uh, we take the data from this report in the calculation of your annual rate. Uh, this is a five-year report, and the next three reports are also five-year reports, so it's 15, 16, 17, and 18, and 19. Uh, this is a summary report, as I said, and it gives you everything from your payroll to your base premiums, claims, costs. Uh, you also have your number of compensation days. Uh, so, this report is also referred to as your 16C1. The next report is your annual cost per claims, and this gives you a little bit more detail about your claims cost per annum. Uh, and then the final one is your total cost per claim. And that just gives for five years again, it gives the total cost per claim over the last five years. And it breaks it down into the type of cost as well, so your compensation, your medical, your rehabilitation, it breaks down exactly what the cost of the claim is in summary, yeah. So finally, uh, Cost relief. Uh, I know some of you today had some questions about cost relief, so I'm just gonna generally cover it as per our policy. And again, if you have any, want to discuss it in more detail, we'll be very happy to do so at the, after, after the session. So cost relief, uh, cost relief is not, like each claim that comes into the Workers' Compensation Board is reviewed for cost relief. Uh, it's commonly given on a claim where the, the Workers' Compensation Board have determined that the employer should not be either fully burdened with the cost or partially burdened with them with the cost. So some relief is given. Co this is commonly uh, given when there's a, a pre-existing injury, for example. Other uh, examples is where, um, for, the for, for example, if it was an SGI claim, and SGI takes liability for the claim. Or another example is when you in we incorrectly assign a claim to the wrong employer if you manage. So that's why it's so important on your E1 that you make it very clear as to which, which entity uh, that claimant has been injured under. So uh, cost relief, when, if you've been granted cost relief on a claim, it is automatically applied to the year in which it was granted. So that credit if it was cost that was relieved from 2015, they will automatically apply to 2019 as a credit. And that credit will be used to offset future costs in the future calculation of your rate. Um, however, employers do have the option to get their rates recalculated uh, based on the current year with 19 eight, and previous two rate years, so 19, 18, and 17. 
that request must be submitted to us in writing. So we often get uh, questions from employers where cost relief has been granted and we can discuss that with you in more detail uh, to help you make a decision whether it would be more beneficial. But they, at the end of the day, the decision is, is, is yours. Uh, so finally, uh, we're going to just add just there are some employer resources that is available to you. Uh, on our website, we have a whole array of forms and fact sheets, everything from clearances to experience rating to everything. We have a prevention department, and we have some of our account management managers here today. <laughs> um, so we also have the Industry Safety Associations, WorkSafe Saskatchewan, Occupational Health and Safety, our Fair Practices Office, and they, these uh, there's tables outside. I think with with most uh, represented here. We also have an appeals office, so any decision that the WCB makes, you have the right as an employer to uh, appeal it. So that's it for, for now. Thank you, have a good day.